Welcome to a Road Less Traveled podcast. I'm Hillary Heron, your host. This is a virtual edition focusing on heroines in history. We're very excited to share these stories with you from the women who have helped pave the way to the future that we are so lucky to be able to walk on. Hi, Erica. Thank you for joining us today on a Road Less Traveled podcast. I'm very excited for this uh, little bit different format, and I cannot wait to dive into the first, uh, our our first woman from history. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Hill. As you know, um, this is one of my big passions, is history, um, and getting to talk to other people about it. So um, a little preface. Um I know you've got some questions for me and I've got some notes and I tried to really um, focus on the larger picture discussions. I actually was going through my notes and I was like, you don't need to know the exact like, you know, date, time, location of like, let's think big picture. So if I get a little nerdy, redirect me. No worries. Got it. Excellent. So do you want to start off talking about Pocahontas? I am totally down. I love cartoons. <laughs> Excellent. And that's why we're talking about her today. Um, so as you probably know, uh, Lily Gladstone is the first woman, first indigenous woman to be nominated for an Oscar. Um, and this is huge because, of course, indigenous folks have been have had their own careers in the film industry, both, you know, independently and as background characters since Hollywood moved to California, well, since Hollywood started, right? Since California. And like since anything Pope started. Exactly. And Pocahontas, like, so my big thing is American history. Most people, when you say, can you name an indigenous woman? They're going to tell you Pocahontas or Sacagawea, um, right? So Sacagawea was with Lewis and Clark in the 1800s. Pocahontas was the Virginia colony in 1600s. Um, and what we know about them is just so much surface level. Um, so I wanted to introduce you to who and what Pocahontas was and how she navigated men in the 16th century, both from her culture and then from the English culture that came in and set up the Virginia colony. Um, but what most people don't realize because of the cartoon is when she enters the sort of American history picture, she was 14. Oh, wow. I mean, she was a yeah. Disney made her seem a little bit more like she was, you know, 22. Exactly. She was feeling 22. Sorry. I okay. not myself. <laughs> uh, Taylor Swift is relevant. I can't help it. She's if you want to talk about right women in male dominated industries, mm -hmm. she's she's the the it. Yes. Um, but yeah, so Pocahontas actually was a child. Um, and we think of her as being like this sort of almost mythical figure. And in fact, she was kind of ordinary. Like her father was a chief. She was a part of the Powhatan tribe. Um, but her father was only chief because they were matrilineal. So it was her mother being um, a, a hierarchical figure within the Powhatan tribe that gave him power. Now that was lost in the movie. Little bit, little bit. <laughs> and um, what happened was, and I'm using a book, um, which I, I gave to your folks, sorry, um, called Pocahontas and the English Boys is sort of my main reference for our conversation. Um, Pocahontas was sent to the Virginia colony as sort of a, like an adversary advocate uh, for the Powhatan tribe. And the colonists sent three teenage English boys to the Powhatan tribes. And they lived among different tribes in the Powhatan nation. And the idea was that young children were malleable and could um, assimilate and adapt and learn the language and try to be a mediator between the two, um, the two cultures. So it was kind of like a an lot of exchange program. It was, it was. Um, uh, as you might guess, the exchange on the Powhatan side was a little less of an exchange and a little bit more of a hostage situation at more than one time. Um, so more than once she was held hostage in the, uh, in Jamestown, which was the center the founding of the Virginia colonies. Um, and the whole story with John Smith that we see in the Pocahontas movie is fun and it is somewhat accurate, right? There's the big scene at the end where Pocahontas runs and like throws herself over John Smith and says, but father, I love him or whatever. Like you can't kill him. Um, and that happened actually. And we have a really cool engraving of it 
Um, and it's the engraving is by uh, an Englishman who was in the Virginia colonies at the time. We don't know if he was there at the event, but it's kind of the most accurate primary source we can get of it. Um, but there have been some really cool articles written about how this was probably more of a um, ceremonial show than it was. And it certainly wasn't anything about love, like not like the movie, but it was more ceremonial. And it was part of her role as a leader in the community to save this man who is from a essentially an enemy tribe, right? Or an enemy nation. Um, and so it happens, but it's really twisted a lot. Um, and that's that's kind of my rundown on her. She did a lot of things, and I am excited to talk to you about how she did them. Um, but if you let me go, I'll go forever. So what are some questions you've got? I'm really interested in, well, first of all, like this kind of train thing. Like, did they take her as a hostage and then... The people went back and were like, fine, then we're taking your boys. So, no. So it started off a little more amicably. They picked three of the youngest members of the the Jamestown community. Again, this is all men. This is before Jamestown has become established. It's still part of the Virginia company. Um, And they decided to do an exchange. And the boys were sent out, some of them to like farther off um, tribes within the Powhatan Nation because it's, you know, the Powhatan Nation would be multiple tribes. And sometimes they're at war. Sometimes they're all under one nation. Um, and I'm I'm not an expert in uh, early indigenous folks, but I've done a lot of research in this area. Um, and they went off in pretty good faith. But what would happen is Pocahontas had already sort of been this really curious little kid who started showing up. And so her, one of her trips to Jamestown Colony was, um, she was basically she showed up and they held her there until the until her father was willing to to negotiate favorably. Um, it was interesting, but during one of these trips, uh, she's a little bit older. I think she was uh, so maybe the first time was twelve, not fourteen. But she married. Um, yeah, the, and this was before we even get to the the sort of marriage part of it. But she did wind up marrying an Englishman. His name was John Rolfe. And most people don't know who he is, even those of my like students who study history. Um, John Rolfe is the reason. Well, let me rephrase. Pocahontas is the reason the Virginia colony became a financial success. So she but she married him on purpose. She married him on purpose while she was uh, while she was in one of her stays in the in the colony. Okay, yeah. But she married him on purpose. And I guess he was a nice guy. But of course, he was in his 30s or 40s. And she she married him, but she taught him to plant tobacco, which was an indigenous crop in Virginia. And so Virginia became incredibly wealthy on tobacco production and sale. And that's where sort of the the big push of cigars and later uh, c- cigarettes, right? And even um, sometimes what we call snuff, which is like dried tobacco that you can snort like cocaine. Um, all of it was a that's tobacco product. News to me. I live under a rock. Okay. Yeah, they actually not slight, googling slight that. Track. They had snuff boxes, and they would be these really cute, dainty boxes full of powder that you could <laughs> sniff. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, okay. That's new. It is new to me. But it's um, not new. It's new to me. Okay. So Pocahontas is 14 ish and married to a 30 something year old and teaching him about planting indigenous crops. Where along the historical line of preserving this story does it get perverted into a raccoon loving cartoon Miko's my favorite so uh i'm actually not upset about him um i'm not 100 percent sure but what we do know particularly about this era is that 99 percent of the history was written by men so men would write down what they thought was important um there is a lot of information that's been lost in history it's impossible to save it all but What historians have found is a lot of this information is lost because men write the history and men write down what they think is important. 
And in that time period, women were never the main character. They were always at best, right, a loving helper. Um, they were like the, even the concept of a partner wasn't wasn't accepted in marriage. So other than like there's this native girl who's working with the colony, what was there to say about her? Um, so she's she's really sort of a product of men writing her her story and they write her agency out of it because she chose to marry John Rawl. She chose to teach him how to how to um, plant tobacco. And then later in life, she goes to England. So if you're a Disney fan and you've seen Pocahontas 2, it's her trip to England and it killed her. She went and she got smallpox and she died. I have not seen Pocahontas 2, even though I am a big Disney fan. Um, but she, I mean, and for that time period is pretty unusual to to go, you know, back and forth or. Yes. And she didn't get back. We do know of two or three other indigenous folks before her that had gone to England, one of whom we know came back. Um, and when indigenous folks would go to England and later we saw the same with African folks, they were exoticized, which means they were foreign and therefore really cool. And it was weird because John Rolfe was had money from being a tobacco planter. So she was able to dress as a wealthy woman. She was called Rebecca. Um, she went by the Christian. Yeah, she took the Christian name Rebecca because when she married John Rolfe, um, she became a Christian and was so that she could be married in the Anglican church. So did she part from her family? What was her relationship like with them after that? So I don't have a lot of detail on this, um, and I'm pretty good at saying when I don't know something. Yeah, uh, We know she maintai- maintained ties with the Powhatan community because that was still her job, right? She was valuable, not just because she could plant, which... She could, but because she had the relationship. So it's likely she continued to have a relationship with her tribe, but I don't know the extent of it. Um, and I don't know if she was like going for summer vacation and hanging out with with dad. Um, yeah, so it it really changed. But she made these de- decisions as a woman who had her own power. Again, we call it agency where, OK, I'm going to convert to Christianity. I'm going to marry this guy. I'm going to. These are how I'm going to make, like secure my own life and future. And we don't talk about that. In that particular time period, that's un- unheard of. I mean, even now you hear a lot of stories of, you know, can't get married unless I convert or I want to get married or, you know, even now it's still like a really kind of ingrained thing. Uh, so for her to have done that, it must have taken tremendous strength. Um, and for if, you know, if men are recording history, right? Uh, and she is being recorded, if, if this much of her experience is being recorded that we're even able to study her movements and behavior, she must have been incredibly influential for her, for her period, for her space. Absolutely. And when she went to England, she was like a, a celebrity, basically, um, because John Smith had already gone back to England because he was an adventurer. So his job was to go to Jamestown, help set up the colony, and then leave and go Whoa, do the next adventure. that's a job? I think I'm signing up for that. I'm now an right? adventurer. Please send we me to the places. You, we'll get you a ship and off you go. Yay! Um, and yeah, so he was like, it was, his job was like, oh, you're going to go set up a new colony in an unknown land? I'll go as like protection and a guide. Like I can help you decide which things are edible and how to build a structure. So he went back and forth and then she went back. I'm just trying to figure out how this would even work at that time. I mean, we're, we're was it so the trek between? The voyage was about like a month? Yeah. Uh, it was about a, a month. Week. It was three weeks to a month, depending on okay. weather and current. Um, and that was a shot in the dark. That was a total guess. Thank you to my third grade teacher. Right. Don't you love when that works out? Um, yeah. So it was about a month. Um, sometimes more. Again, it, it would not be. Like people wouldn't worry if it had been six weeks um, just because if there's no wind and you get stuck um, or if the current you're fighting the currents. Yes. So if I don't hear from my parents in 24 hours, uh, I'm quite literally sending out a search party that includes like pigeons and faxes. So to wait for like six weeks and be like, oh, it's totally normal. Like that is a completely foreign concept to me. So he would go back and forth. 
she did she stay most of the time or like so she stayed in in the Jamestown colony. The oh. only time she got on a ship and went to England she, was this trip. Yeah, late. I think she's in her late twenties, early thirties. Right, that was my question. So she was very um, young. She was very young. Her whole life was very young, and yet she literally is the reason Virginia became such a financial powerhouse. And Virginia was also the first colony to bring Africans over, and then twenty years later to begin enslaving those Africans. Because the first Africans, fun fact, were not slaves. They were considered indentured against their will. We would still call them slaves. But the legal definition of slave didn't exist yet. The word existed because the Romans and the Greeks and the ancient times had had slaves. But the the legal premise around what is an indentured servant, what is a slave, actually started. So 1619 is when the first uh, ship of Africans came to uh, what is now Virginia. So the Jamestown area is about. Uh, so 1607 is when uh, John Smith landed in Jamestown. 1619 is when we got the first Africans. So it, it wasn't very long. So it is possible that there is some overlap with the first Africans in Pocahontas. Um, but I again, I I don't know that well enough. We do know that Africans were treated somewhere between an indigenous person and an indentured servant. Um. And indentured servitude had a very specific legal definition with, I don't want to say rights, because there really weren't rights in the way that we think of human rights today, but of the sort of responsibilities between the owner of the indenture contract or the master and the indentured servant. Um, and usually you were in servitude for seven years and then you would be released usually with some money or land. Usually, but not always. So we talk about male dominated, like the all the things that we just touched on, or that you just touched on, really, that are blowing my mind, are male dominated. The rules are made by men. The and and the rules are made by middle aged, which that definition of middle aged has changed over time. <laughs> it has changed a little yeah. bit. Yes, um, white men, and history is recorded by middle aged white men. Um. And I mean, are there other sources? Are that were there other were, were people like were women secretly keeping diaries? Are there are there other historical sources that I mean have made their way at least to researchers? The short answer to your question: Are there were women writing? Are there sources? Is yes, and we're going to talk about one of those in a little while, actually, in one of our later podcasts together. Um, but I want to introduce you to I want to talk a little bit more about the women who wanted to be scientists, scholars, historians. Um, so there were a few women that wanted to be. You know, they wanted the same professional opportunities as men. When you think of a little more modern, think like Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. That was in the eight, uh, 1800s. So that's 200 years. I like you say um, more modern 200 years. It is more modern. Um, 2024. Right. Well, Mary Shelley is one of them. Um, Madame Curie, right? Like in the modern world, there are these women who entered these male-dominated industries. Well, there were back then too. Um, and a lot of them either had to be independently wealthy or marry a man. So again, when we talk about How, like- Pause. Hold that thought. How is yeah. a woman at this time independently wealthy? In the In the case of Pocahontas, they would have- likely imprisoned or killed her and taken her tobacco. Um, there was one of her and a lot of colonists, uh, even even though the first first group was only a couple hundred. Right. You've got men with guns versus an indigenous woman who may or may not be able to use indigenous weapons. Um, again, don't have the information on that. Um, but European women could be born into wealth and. um maybe choose not to get married. Some of them who were interested in male professions didn't. They sort of flouted social norms, stayed spinsters, and spinsters never got married or married late in life. Um, another thing, you could marry a man. He dies. You get his money. And widows in England and Europe had a lot more freedom. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, the Mary widow, M-E-R-R-Y. 
um, like the Merry Wives of Windsor from Shakespeare, um, they didn't have a lot of the social constraints that unmarried single women did. Um, they, it's like they leveled up. And so they could get away with more. And some of the things they could get away with was writing under a pseudonym, was booking passage to the Americas in the end of the 16, into the 1700s. It's like marriage was kind of a rite of pa passage during that time. Like you get married and now you're an adult or for some reason able to make your own decisions. Well, you're able to make your own decisions if your husband dies and you're above a certain age. For some women, if you were under 25 and your husband died, you went back to the care of your closest male relative. For some, it depended on your status, your money, your age, your family. Um, but these women who could would sometimes do things like book a voyage, uh, particularly in the 1700s when colonies are well established on the modern day United States, Eastern Coast and in the Caribbean. And so there's a woman, um, there's a botanist and I can't remember her name, but she's around in the 1700s. She went down to the Caribbean and she knew she was a bot. She said, she said, I am a scientist. I am going on an academic scientific journey. I'm going to learn about the flora and fauna of the Caribbean. So she goes to the Caribbean and she starts taking notes. And it was very common at the time for botanists and just other explorers, scientists, scholars to go to a foreign land and bring things back. And they'd bring back seeds and they would plant them. And there were whole gardens in Europe and England that were like, again, the exotic like plants of the Americas. Well, she went down there and she recorded in the 1700s um, a flower that was used by indigenous women, so African and indigenous folks in the Caribbean. So it had been used as birth control and an abortifacient, which meant it would induce an abortion. Okay. And because male botanists got the flower and male botanists didn't see doctors or medicine men using this flower... They just sent it back to Europe and said, it's a pretty flower. Go ahead and plant it. And the women are like, um, we've been using this as birth control forever. This is this is how we, you know, this is how we have maintained female health. And this European female botanist went down, found it, wrote a whole treatise on it. Um, and even her notes are basically lost to history because male botanist said, well, this is, this is, this isn't right. This is, we've been down there. We've seen it. They don't use it for medicine. She's like, if you talk to women, they do. So a whole part of the population that's actually utilizing this is just not heard. Is not heard. The white women who would be slightly, taken slightly more seriously are ignored when they bring it up. And because those properties don't, like, don't hit the male radar because it's not important to them, to men and male health, we don't see it. And so there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole study of, of like women's history, women's studies that is now trying to find these old things and piece it together and figure out what we left, what narratives we've missed in history. I wonder how many of these things are like buried in capsules underground. It tends to be when we do something like that, we find what's called material culture, which is a shoe, a watch, okay. a bracelet. All of those things have meaning. And even the type of thing that it is, we can likely associate it with certain groups of people. So, um, for instance, if you go to um, an old plantation or an old um, like presidential home kind of thing, they'll excavate the slave quarters and they'll find they have found that almost exclusively enslaved folks ate out of bowls rather than on plates. And that was important. And they said, well, why would they need bowls and so many bowls? Well, enslaved folks got the worst parts of the meat, the, 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 the steaks, the chops, the nice parts of the meat went to the white family. The leftover went to the enslaved folks. And in order to make that eat that meat edible, you had to stew it or braise it for hours until okay. it was a soup and fell off the bone. Okay, well, that so makes we learn perfect sense. So we can learn about mm -hmm. women. That's that's my most that's my easiest option um, to to kind of explain. I don't have any specifics on women, but obviously, if you found a smaller shoe or if they found a small leather glove, that might be a child or a woman. So 
we can use material culture to piece this together. What we're finding on the like women writing things down is people who have family papers who are coming forward and giving those papers to historical societies. And we're reading those. And that's how we're learning a little bit more about women's roles in war, in, you know, politics, in business that we're not told about. Well, I mean, even back to kind of Pocahontas, she's yeah. kind of running it from the background. She's very she's much so teaching him how to do it, teaching him how to sell it, te- like teaching him. He has no concept of this, right? He's not from where she's <laughs> from. He has no idea about yeah. background. He's, he's an adventurer. Um which again, I'm again. This up is for. John Rolfe, not John Smith. It don't. So, so then why does she jump adventure. on John Smith? Let me get back to Pocahontas. Why does she go from John Rolfe and jump on John Smith and then go to Europe? So she starts with John Smith, and by starts with, I mean John Smith is the one that is there when the colony is founded and when they start the relationships with the Powhatan tribe. Um, he leaves, and John Rolfe comes later, and that's when. And in one of the times she is being held hostage in the colony. She decides to marry John Rolfe. So it's and this idea, right, even of saying, well, when did she jump from John Smith to John Rolfe? There was never any John Smith. Like, well, I didn't I don't her. mean from him. I just yeah, meant yeah, yeah. from like what she did to being married, like because yeah. it was like a, a yeah. ceremonial thing where she was like, just don't kill this person. Not I'm not necessarily in love with him, which is right. Movie obviously takes out of class, but yeah. don't don't kill him. But then she right. marries someone. You know, that is partially because she's now doing more stuff with the colony. She's learned English. She's an asset. So holding on to her in an effort to negotiate with Pow- the chief Powhatan is um, is beneficial to them anyway, because she now speaks the language, both languages, and she has the the indigenous plant knowledge. So it's interesting because John John Smith did write some papers. I haven't read them in a long time, but I've read excerpts. And he talks about her in his papers, particularly later in life because she comes to England and she's a celebrity. And he seems to talk about her as like his little friend. Like I met this little friend. Um, And again, when he talks about her, it's this is the John Smith story. And I know you all want to know about this famous person. Like it's never about he never talks about the things she could do for the colony. So when she goes to Europe, um and she passes she's in her 20s do do you know do does she go home like does she get sent home she's buried in england i don't know the exact location i think it's uh on the outskirts of london um and her grave is still there and you can go visit it um john rolfe never went back and i believe she had a son and that son also stayed in england i'm gonna have to rewatch the movie and figure out how history how you know cartoons stray so far from like actual history well again men wrote it men wrote the cartoon (laughs) like um i don't i mean look i i have a master's degree in history i love i love history i love all of this and i love the bad history a lot of times too right the music in pocahontas is great and maybe there's a kid out there a little girl a little boy a little anyone who's like this chick's cool i want to study her and so I've had professors who fall all over the spectrum. I have one professor who absolutely hated Hamilton. It's so inaccurate. And I'm like, yes, but do you know how many kids think history is a valid career option now? Because Lin-Manuel says you can go, you know, make a Broadway play and make millions. Fine. I don't care why you study history. Just study it. Are there any stories about or does it show up in in anything that you have, have touched of, you know, the allies for Pocahontas, either male or female? I haven't seen anything like that. Um, she was surprisingly well received in England, which is a surprisingly big deal considering she was indigenous and considering we know that within a hundred years from when she was there, um, black racism was systematically ingrained in British culture. Um, it's shocking that she was so well received. Um, I don't, know that they, even the idea of being an advocate would have dawned on anyone because she's wealthy. Her husband's wealthy. Why does she need an advocate? The best we've got is 
the stories of the boys who were sent to the indigenous, to the Powhatan tribes, um, because they could all write. And one of them actually grew up and wrote it down. I don't remember their names, so I'm not going to butcher it. But what we know from them who, again, were white and could write. And when they wrote and spoke for themselves, the thing they talked about is rather than winding up being, you know, like a really effective mediator, you took a child, you sent them to another culture, you raised them in that culture. And then you said, now tell me how to now tell me how to basically screw them over. And you wound up with I think one of the boys died very young in, in a in a battle of some sort. He was fighting something. One of them lived to adulthood and went back into white society. Um, and the third one, we don't know what happened to him. And, you know, what we've learned is they didn't make advocates. They made children who were multicultural, which is a great thing, but also meant that they were sympathetic towards the indigenous needs. And that's not what you want if you're trying to found an empire um, and take someone else's land. That's also why when we talk about like you, no one's ever heard of these boys. I read it in a book published by the right New York University Press. It's only going to be read in in a graduate programs. It's unlikely to ever be very popular. Well, because then that doesn't allow for this story that the story of Pocahontas that has come to be to exist as a story of a woman making her own decisions, doing things on her own having a career, a job, a life, whatever, that doesn't support that story. Correct. It also doesn't support the founding narratives that we've created as a nation, right? A lot of our country is founded on these sort of larger than life, legendary, mythical creatures and figures. Think of George Washington. It's a cult following. He was just a dude at the end of the day. He did amazing things, but he fell into them as much as he did them with purpose and everything else. So it really goes against sort of the the narrative we've told of how the American founding happened at Jamestown. Um, I mean, it sounds literally what I see in my head is just kind of like a bunch of European white guys at like a a European white guy statue. Um, but, you know, that's not how any society moves forward. So it's really it's interesting um, how how dominated it is by male characters. I mean, even like you mentioned Hamilton, even Hamilton, the musical, heavily dominated by male characters. And we know that the three, the really the three women, so the three Schuyler sisters in the Hamilton musical, each had very distinct political lives um, because their father was a general who became, uh, I don't know if it was a state senator or a New York City. I think it was a state senator. He was active in politics. So they grew up in politics. And uh, Angelica, in particular, was so well respected, quietly in the background. Um, she was she married a British man and moved to England. She moved to London. But she was writing to Thomas Jefferson. She was writing to uh, Thomas Paine. She was writing to Ben Franklin. She was writing to English and French uh, political, you know, great political minds of her day. And she was having fairly philosophical, political, theoretical conversations with these men. And we don't talk about that. We talk about her as being a sidekick. Um, and again, I don't know what Pocahontas's theoretical, philosophical underpinnings were, but she's a woman who literally made the foundation of the American colonies possible. And we act like she's just some kind of cute sidekick character. Well, and it's mind blowing as much um, attention as our society puts on, you know, financial success um, when we're talking, especially when we're talking about tobacco, which is something that in this country has been integral in the success of so many um, that her story gets lost. Yeah. And when you read history books, so like an American history textbook, they're going to talk about John Rolfe and how he had the first tobacco plantation and he was the one who figured out how to grow and uh, cure tobacco because tobacco then has to be dried and kind of smoked cured in order to turn it into a cigarette or a cigar or snap. Um, and, and, you know, he figured out how to do that. And it's like he did not. 
He figured out how to monetize it, maybe. But she figured out how to, she told him how to do that because it was already being done. It was already being done by indigenous folks. They were, yep, they were using tobacco themselves. So it was, it was not John Rolfe. It was the Powhatan tribe and Pocahontas specifically. I feel like now I have more research to do on Pocahontas and, you know, I have more questions. I'm going to reserve those for later. Questions are always good. Um, I just, I think just now is just a very pivotal time in our, you know, in our current society, seeing Lily Gladstone, um, seeing her support other indigenous women. Um, fun fact, most of the clothing and jewelry she's been wearing on the red carpets and in her Vogue photo shoots have been by indigenous um, artists and designers. See, it's amazing. And How do you store this information? It's, I have questions. <laughs> I have other, I have other uh, questions. I'll we'll save those for later, too. Uh, I don't know, but I, I guess I think it's important. I think it's important we talk about her and what she represents and we can't talk about her if we don't understand how indigenous women have played a role in the making of this country and and I'm barely scratching the surface right we're we're talking about hundreds of years of indigenous women being their own agents being oppressed coming back from it you know finding ways to survive and thrive and then helping us but again we know two women Pocahontas and Sacagawea I feel like we're going to need to um to pick another one I would love to do that. Well, thank you for sharing um, Pocahontas with us and some of the things that make her so special. Um, yay to Disney for like kind of telling her story and getting it out there, but also on the way that they interpreted it. Um, but, you know, here we are. At least there is some awareness around it. So thank you for providing a little bit more. Oh, you're so welcome. I love talking about it. And I look forward to having some other great conversations with you as we move forward. A huge thank you to our incredible guests for sharing their stories, wisdom, and breaking down barriers with us. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Your support means the world to me and helps spread the word about the amazing women paving the road less traveled in male-dominated industries. If you have suggestions for a future guest or topic you'd like me to explore, please reach out on social media. I'd love to hear from you. Follow me on your favorite social platform for updates and behind the scenes. Keep pushing boundaries, challenging norms, and lifting each other up.